All right, thank you for joining us today on Campfire Chats with Honorable Outfitters. Today we have a special guest. We have Kent Vining of Sarge Vining YouTube channel. Now, Kent Vining has got a lot of experience he's going to share with us today, and you want to hold off to the very end because that's when we're going to get to the good part. And uh, Kent Vining uh, started out uh, living in New Hampshire, and now he lives in Texas. He joined the Army and uh, served his time, and he must have found a passion for uh, carrying the rucksack because uh, hiking and camping was a big passion of his long after. So, Sarge Vining, uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. Um, it means a lot for you, me to, for you to come on our channel. Hey, thanks a lot, Sean. You know, uh, being your first guest is kind of an honor as well. So uh, I just hope I'm not. I hope I'm a good guinea pig. <laughs> I'm sure you will be. Now, uh, those of you who are listening, uh, Sarge Viney is kind of a, a mentor of mine because I started out in uh, classic camping living history by accident. And I found his Facebook channel, Bannerman's uh, Outdoor Living History Group on Facebook. And it's a very welcoming group. I suggest if you are interested in classic camping that you check it out because it's a great community full of people. And Sarge Vining uh, makes you feel welcome. And if whatever question you have, even if it's a noob or experienced question, doesn't matter. Uh, he's always willing to help out along with all the others in the group. So, uh, Sarge, uh, going all the way back, starting from the very beginning, what got you into camping and outdoor adventure or what is your origin story if you will well uh i i guess you could say that i was born into it uh my very earliest memory had to be no more than about three years old is of uh in a cabin with my mom and dad uh when my dad got married my grandfather gave him half of an acre uh that he had on a lake in southern New Hampshire. Uh, Dad was working uh, construction at the time on the highway. When that job ended, he bought one of their line shacks and pulled it onto that uh, that half acre property. Uh, and that's where we lived uh, between well, late March to late September every year. Uh, Mom and Dad were saving money on rent by living in the cabin uh, so that they could buy a house. I, they eventually bought the house when I was in the second grade. So every year from, from the time I was born until the second grade, uh, we spent our summers, springs, and, uh, and falls in this, uh, in this cabin, which, like I said, it started out as a line shack and then uh, got to be a... Uh, <clears throat> A uh, two-room cabin with a loft. My brother and I slept in the loft. My my mother and dad slept in the combination living room, kitchen, dining room. Uh, and today, people would call it an off-grid cabin. Uh, back then, it was just the lake house that you know, and and the lake house wasn't anything special back then either. It's the nineteen fifties. So my earliest memories are of being in the woods and, and going hiking with my dad. Uh, uh, another early memory, every year when we went out there, the first uh, thing we, we did after we got out there and got settled is dad would take me and my brother on a trip out to a, a tree house he had built when he was a kid. that was about a mile away from where the cabin was. So every year I got to to uh, take a one mile hike with my dad for the very first thing. So, uh, and, and living in New Hampshire, you're surrounded by mountains and woods. Uh, when I grew up, when you went back to school uh, and people started asking, each, uh, nobody asked, where did you go? What did you do on your vacation? The question always was, where did you go camping? You know, and so it, it was like I was nothing special. I wasn't adventurous. I wasn't different from every everybody was going camping. Uh, we lived about uh, uh, five miles from the second biggest lake in, in New Hampshire. And uh, uh, the great thing about that, it was the reservoir for two counties and they had it fenced off. And the woods was out there and there was a sign that says 
you can't come in in here. Uh, and the one thing you don't tell an eight-year-old boy is, look at these woods. You can't come in here. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, me and my buddies and my brother, uh, we spent our, our summers out there uh, on uh, Lake Massabesic was, was the lake. So, yeah, I've, I've been camping all my life. All right. So uh, going a little bit back there, what is a line cabin? I've never heard that term before until now. Uh, a line uh, uh, a line shack, a job site shack, uh, and you know it's it's basically just a very small structure where the foreman uh, keeps files and drawings and things like that. Uh, I remember e- even even as a, a little three year old, four year old boy, uh, that it was a fairly small space. Uh, when we first okay. had that shack, uh, it had just enough room. For uh, a pair of army bunk beds and a shelf on one wall where uh, there was a Coleman stove and underneath that was a cooler. And uh, yeah, for the first couple of years, that was what living out there by the lake was. Uh, eventually, Dad added on to it and it just got bigger and that, that line shack became Ma's kitchen. Uh, but uh, you know, it just, it, it wasn't very big, you know, it, it, you know, some place to keep the tools when you're on a construction, uh, uh, thing. So it was, you know, uh, it was great. Uh, when I sit and, and, and I want to uh, be at peace, I think about, uh, that time out there by the lake and, and hiking, uh, and camping out by Lake Massabesic. Uh, but, it, you know, nothing, nothing really special. I was just one of the guys. Everybody else was doing it. Yeah, that, that's that's fascinating. Because um, Dick Prinicky, or I think I pronounced that right. I'm not exactly sure. But he built his cabin just for himself. One man. You know, and it's a pretty decent-sized cabin that he built. And I'm ima- trying to imagine basically uh, an office space and an entire family living in there. I, I would think that would be dreadful. It, it, it didn't, you know, it, it, it wasn't small for very long. Mom and dad slept. And, and these were two, uh, <laughs> the, bunk, the, the bunk beds were basically two twin size beds, one on top of the other. My brother and I slept uh-huh. in one and my mother and dad slept in the other. And, of course, the first order of business was to build that front room out front so that we weren't all, you know, my mother and dad got a bigger bed and I got my own bunk and my brother got his own bunk. You know, so <laughs> and and then and and, of course, dad added on the loft and everything. And we, uh, it was, you know, it was a constant building thing for about seven or eight years. And when he got it to a, you know, decent shape, he sold it and took the money that he had saved on rent and uh, bought a nice uh, hundred year old farmhouse uh, in the suburbs of Manchester, New Hampshire, just down the road from, uh, like I said, a a huge lake that nobody but 10 year old kids could go into. So it was a wonderful life. It really was. So you really, uh, like you said, you grew up in it. Um, and at no point you growing up in this, it was just, uh, it was still an adventure for you. It wasn't just part of life. Cause I, I know a lot of kids, you know, I'm a scout leader and everything. And a lot of kids that I live in a rural area and, uh, they have some property. Those kids, they, they don't like going in the woods, even though it's all around them. They don't really care for it, but you were living that life and, um, it was a playground and you never grew tired of it. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I, I talked to a friend of mine, uh, uh, last year, he came to visit me. He he still lives in New Hampshire, spends uh, winters in Florida, and, and he came and stayed with me for about a week. And I, I told him, I said, uh, uh, I noticed that uh, some uh, a housing development had gone up outside the boundaries of of uh, the the uh, the lakes. The, the, the lake's boundaries. And I said, there must be a lot of kids going out there now. There's probably a lot of paths and things. And he said, no, he says, kids just don't do that anymore. Uh, 
You know, w- when I grew up, my mother would know, uh, particularly in the summertime, times, uh, my mother would know I was alive because food went missing from the refrigerator every couple of days. <laughs> you know, and, and and if she looked outside and looked across uh, the yard over to the to the street next door, and wasn't a street, but anyway, it was a rural area. But she, she could see the, the my buddy Mike's yard and if mike was in the yard in his yard and i wasn't in mine my mother got worried okay that meant i was off doing something else but if i was gone and, mike <laughs> yeah. was gone and my brother was gone we were camping my mother knew it you know so you know it's just not that way anymore parents my dad my dad encouraged this behavior my my mother, of course, was a little worried, but my dad actually encouraged it. You know, let them go out in the woods, let them learn. You know, and uh, you know, like I said, some of my 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 best memories. Uh, it, it, you know how sometimes you just want to go to your happy place. Amen. I close my my eyes and and I see I I see the the area around Lake Massabesic where where we went camping. Uh, yeah, that's that. That's where I I learned everything, and a lot of it I just I, I learned by doing myself and making mistakes, and my my dad laughing at me for making the mistake. <laughs> so, uh, dad, dad, dad was an Eagle Scout, so I did I did learn a lot from that. Uh, I I was never a scout, uh, but I devoured the scouts' manual. My my dad's scouts manual from the uh, 30s and 40s. He was a scout in the 30s and 40s, uh, and I devoured that manual. And, and of course, you know, all of my friends and their fathers and grandfathers and uncles and and all they were all <laughs> steeped in, in all of this this camping stuff too. So, like I said, it was just it was just a normal part of life. It wasn't anything really special to go camping. It's just what everybody did. And having right, said right. that, uh, campsites weren't crowded like they are today. Uh, we used to go up to the White Mountains, uh, the, the National Forest up there, and we could just drive up anytime we wanted to and find a campsite at any one of the developed camping areas. Uh, oh, wow. today, right. today, I look and I see lines five mile long on the side of the road, uh, trying to get to a trailhead in the White Mountains, let alone finding a place to camp. So, uh, yeah, things have things have changed drastically since I was a boy. That's it's kind of odd because, um, if anything, my imagination. You know, my imagination would paint the opposite picture that today that camping is kind of a dying thing. You know, um, and the the golden age of camping, no matter or outdoor adventure, w- is behind us. You know, so it's a uh, it's refreshing to hear that experience from you. That there's still a lot of hope. There's still a lot of uh, people interested in getting out there, even if it is you know glamping or or relaxed hiking or something. Yeah, well, I I think what what it is, it, it's a function of the size of the population. I, I, as far as the general population is concerned. Uh, I believe probably the same percentage of people are heading to the woods uh, as there were a hundred years ago. Uh, but there's just simply more people. So that right. same percent, you know, that 5% of 2 million is a lot less than 5% of 300 million. So uh, I think that's, that's part of it. Of course, the other part of it is, is there was a huge, uh, Folks your age, and, and I'm awful dang sorry that I'm that old to have to say that phrase, but folks, you've got gray <laughs> hair and you're a young man to me. Uh, uh, dang, lost my chain of thought. Uh, oh, I lost what I wanted to say. You're saying folks my <laughs> age? Yeah, well, it, 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 uh, oh, that's where it is. Folks your age don't realize 
the explosion of backpacking in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, that is, a, as far as the change in, in camping, I don't think there's been much change in car camping, what, what we call motor camping in the 20s and 30s and car camping today. The explosion came in, in backpacking, uh, doing backcountry camping. Uh, that it, Have you ever seen the movie... Uh, Ford versus Ferrari. I have not. It was on my my list, but I have not yet. No. It, you should watch it. There's there there's a there's a great line in there where Lee Iacocca is trying to convince the board of directors of Ford Motor Company to let him make the Mustang. Uh huh. And in it, he says, "We are trying to make a car that we can sell." to the first generation of teenagers that have money in their pocket. And that's, that's what happened with backpack. Uh, suddenly teenagers had money. Uh, you look back at, at my father and my grandfather, they went through years of financial difficulty. Uh, unless you were really, really, really rich you were having financial difficulty and with right. the depression and the panic of the nineties and the, and you know, just a bunch of stuff. And suddenly after world war two, everybody has a job. Everybody's making money. Everybody's putting money in the bank. You can start giving your kids an allowance, you know? And like I said, suddenly teenagers had money and they were able to save for a car or buy a Kelty pack and a, a, a dome tent, uh, you know, go, go to when, when I in about uh, six, seven months, I'm going to be going through the 60s and 70s on my channel and, and do, do this a little better than what I'm doing right now. But uh, you do fine, Sarge. You do a great job there. I'm just saying that, that is what's driving people to the woods today is is. Uh, is backpacking. Uh, and uh, I think that's why it was so easy for, for, for us back in the fifties and the sixties to find a campsite where you can't find one today. You can't find parking at a trailhead or anything like that, simply because people weren't doing the backcountry stuff as much as they are today. There's a higher percentage of backpackers and backcountry folks out there in the woods today than there would have been when I was young. Did that make any sense at all? Because I don't, I don't, I'm not sure it did. But, oh yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, when I when I study the uh, the 20s and 30s uh, camping, uh, I tend to lean more towards the trekking, what we call backpacking today. I, I lean more towards the trekking aspect of it, uh, and where most everybody is focusing on the motor camping aspect of it. Uh, as, as far as classic camping goes, if you look at the way that uh, Dave Westcott and Steve Watts mm -hmm. started out the classic camping thing with the Acorn Patrol, uh, their focus was on uh, the, the camping was suddenly more comfortable than it was before. Uh, and it's a, <laughs> yeah, but but that's uh, the thing that that's something. Thing that that is attractive to uh, old guys like me, reenactors, living history <laughs> historians, uh, to do stuff because we get to sit around and tell lies to our buddies about how good we were when we were young, and then sit back and eat some steak or something like that cooked on the campfire. But what that what that ignores is the fact that this was a time when the long distance trails in this country were starting uh the long trail started I, I don't have my reference material here in front of me but i know that it started it was the first long distance trail and i know it started before the first world war uh, most of the national parks were building trail systems uh within the park uh, the uh if you look at the, the the 
the cover picture for Bannerman's camp is is a group mm-hmm. of hikers from the uh, Smoky Mountains Hiking Society. Uh, they were at the time blazing trails through the Smoky Mountains and lobbying to have it made a national forest or a national park. Uh, all of this was going on. So this is, this is the birth, it's kind of the, the birth of trekking, the birth of recreational backcountry camping, as opposed to recreational motor camping. Uh, this uh, the 20s and the 30s is where it all started. By, by the 1930s, motor camping was pretty much established. You know, it was a new thing mm-hmm. when Henry Ford first made a Model T's cheap and available. But 20 years later, the market was established. Uh, the 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 tools that were that were needed, uh, you know, the Coleman stove had been. Uh, if if you watch my uh, history of gear series, uh, you'll notice that uh, for the first 20, 30 years, I don't focus all that much on on stoves and backpacks and tents because most of that stuff had already been established and were in use by 1920 and had been maybe 10 right. years. By the time we get to 1930, it's pretty much old hat. Everybody, you know, like I said, the way I grew up, everybody's doing it. But right. once people got close to the woods, then they started going into the woods. And that's where backpacking started. That, that you know, that's see, it's kind of like uh, uh, westward expansion begat recreational car camping, which begat backpacking. So, you know, uh, it, uh, but that's that's why I focus on on what I do with, with Bannerman's camp and uh, and and the YouTube channel is I am really trying to trace the history of backpacking along with the history of camping in general. Uh, and I'm just having one hell of a time doing it. I really am. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you, you know, you, you, you've crawled up inside of a wood sleeping robe next to a campfire inside of a, inside of a canvas tent. You get, you, you know how that feels, how much fun that is. Uh, the problem is it's it's difficult. It's hard enough to convince people to go camping a hundred years ago. Uh, now you got to convince them. Okay, now that we're going camping a hundred years ago, let's go backpacking a hundred years ago. Uh, you know, and we're at a time when when uh, a lightweight backpacking just didn't happen. Yeah, the only way you went lightweight backpacking in the twenties and thirties was you left a bunch of stuff home. Right. And, 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 you know. Uh, Although the his, the history of backpacking, the history of camping is a constant tension between uh, weight and bulk, and uh, making a bunch of mental calculations as to uh, you know what do I want to carry the uh, do I want to carry the sleeping bag that will keep me warm down to twenty degrees, uh, but it weighs ten pounds. Or can I get away with a wool blanket that will keep me down and keep me warm down to 40 degrees? And it might not get, you know, it, that there's a whole lot of calculus that has to go on there where, where today uh, you pretty much uh, can choose whatever you want uh, as general. You know, I, I, I'm a hammock camper uh, when I, when I go modern camping Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I have, the, the equipment I use, because I live in Texas, so I, so I have a, a, a bit of advantage in that I don't have freezing <laughs> cold uh, winters. But pretty much the same equipment I take in the winter is stuff I take in the summer. Uh, although I can leave an underquilt home, but we're kind of getting off the woods here. But uh, but what else you got? What else you got? Well. Well, you actually bring up something that I, I wanted, wanted to also bring up or have you discuss. Uh, you know, I found your channel 
impromptu and it, I checked you out and it looked like your early, early stuff on YouTube was uh, hammocking, which is interesting because yeah. then uh, that also got me interested in hammocking and, and watching all your stuff and your handmade hammocks. And like you really went all in into the whole experimenting of, of creating your own gear. You have a history of creating your own gear. So what got you into that? Yeah, yeah, and, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, like I said, I've, 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 I've lived in the woods, lived with camping most of my life. I'm, I'm 70 years old now. Uh, when I, 20 years ago, uh, when I turned 50, it, it just started getting to where I didn't want to uh, get on my hands and knees to go to sleep on top of roots and rocks and uh, was focusing uh, my, my outdoor activities were motor camping, uh, you know, set up a tent at the state park and, you know, use that nasty old rusty grill to make hot dogs. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, then I, and, and then I discovered hammock camping and I said, Whoa, this will get me back out in the woods. So, yeah, I, I went after hammock camping gangbusters. Uh, suddenly, I wasn't having to get on my hands and knees to go to sleep. I was swinging in the breeze. And, and uh, particularly here in Texas in the summertime, uh, hammock camping is, is a pure joy because, yeah, it's, it's 109 degrees outside, but I'm hanging in the middle of the air, swinging back and forth. I've at least got some air movement around me. I sleep a lot cooler in a hammock than I did in a tent and then there's no roots and rocks so uh and and then you know I've always wanted to get other people out into the woods mm -hmm. uh you know like like grow, growing up in New Hampshire I didn't have to do that everybody was going in the woods it, it's when I when I left New Hampshire and and went to places where there isn't that tradition or that many places to go uh, camping here in Texas, we have it's kind of strange uh, in, in that uh, when Texas joined the union, uh, the state retained all of the land that it owned. It did not give any land to the federal government. Uh, no kidding. No kidding. Uh, what federal property that is here in the state today was either given to the federal government by the state or purchased by the state, or it's rented by the, by the federal government. Uh, the national forests were all either sold or given to the federal government uh, and army bases and all of that. Well, that means that most of the uh, camping in Texas, uh, most of the property in Texas that you could camp on is private property. So you need permission. Uh, to, to get in there and 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 camp on somebody's property. Also, here in Texas, we've got a pretty good gun tradition. So if you're camping someplace where you <laughs> you shouldn't, uh, you might want to consider, you know, the uh, the sensibilities of the gentleman <laughs> who owns the place and what he, how he feels about you interfering with his with his cows. So no uh, stealth camping. No stealth camping. No no stealth camping. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and as far as as far as places to camp, I do prefer national forests over state and and national parks, simply because you can camp anywhere you want in a national forest. And that's what I want out of the camping experiences. Mm -hmm. I I really don't want the picnic table and the rusty grill and the uh, screaming kids in the campsite next door. I want to be able to walk out. Uh, well, it used to be 10 miles, and these days it's about three. Uh, walk out into some place where I'm surrounded by trees and nobody else is around, uh, you know, and it's just me and my buddies. So, uh, and that's a, that, that is the kind of camping I, I, I really enjoy. Uh, you're, you're on your own, you know, you're, you're, you're bringing what you got and nothing else. And if you forgot something, you got to suck it up and find another way of doing it. So uh, uh, I, I'll give you a, 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 one of the things 
that uh, I, I learned from in my misspent youth. My brother and I decided one day uh, in the winter, we, you know, we, we were tired of snow and not being able to do anything and not being able to go camping. So we decided we're going to try winter camping. And we sat down and spent about a week planning what we were going to take and how we were going to take it. Because, uh, you know, uh, camping in below freezing weather is kind of a serious thing. How old were you? Uh, probably 10, 11, 12, somewhere in, in that range. Oh, my uh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and like I said, my dad encouraged it. Uh, <laughs> but, we, but we did all this meticulous planning uh, right. right down to what we were going to eat. And, and we had decided that, that we were going to camp to this, part, uh, hike to this particular spot and stop uh, underneath this big old tree uh, to have sandwiches for lunch. And, and, and I, I don't mind telling you, it was cold. And when we stopped for lunch, we decided uh, that we were going to have soup with our sandwiches uh, just to get a little bit of warmth with us. And, and we, we brought extra food because we figured we might need it so we got right. the fire started and everything we pulled out the mess kits and we pulled out the cans of soup and uh that's when he looked at me and said i thought you brought the can opener and i looked at him and said <laughs> i thought you brought the can opener and i learned two things there uh, make sure you've got two can openers and uh fried bologna tastes fairly good but we had to turn around because we had no way of cooking whatever food we had uh, but yeah we fried the bologna because it was the only warm food we were going to get <coughs> excuse me so yeah that's a little something i learned about about planning you know you you so uh, you're if you do backcountry stuff you, you've got to go down to the to the uh the most minute You've, you've actually got to go through every action that you're going to do in your mind. And, you know, while you're sitting in your desk, imagine yourself reaching for your can opener. Where is it? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. It's, it's something I should have done when I was 11 years old. You know, you bring up a good point about uh, about planning. I'm taking my scouts out camping this weekend, and we're in Ohio. Uh, it's actually been a pretty decently warm spring. We, we've got rain all day today. It's supposed to be like in the 30 degrees at night with rain. And um, it's but it's a, our primitive camp out, our annual primitive camp out. So everybody's going to be in canvas dog tents that was donated to the troop. And everybody's cooking for themselves and their, their cook kits instead of like a patrol camp out experience and things. Yeah. And um, my oldest scout uh, he's, he's really good. Like he's been through it and everything. He's um, a star scout and everything. Really, really experienced, very mature too. My oldest son who is uh, 13 and he was born and raised and living history and camping and stuff. And he, today the boy still uh, struggles to go through the checklist and remember. And uh, one of the camp we went to last year about this time, it was rainy, it was muddy and he forgot to bring his boots of all things. So he had to go through the whole camp out with his tennis shoes. And he brought, I think, one extra pair of socks. But that kid had muddy, wet socks, you know, the whole weekend. And he was miserable. He's like, Dad, you know, can I borrow your socks? I'm like, no, no, you forgot your own socks. You're going to have to deal with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's the old joke is, how, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you hike to the shelter. How do you tell the ultralight camper? at the shelter and he's the guy asking for your can opener for your sewing kit for his, if you got an extra spoon, that's, <laughs> that's the ultra light backpacker. So, uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, going back to the hammock thing really quick because hammocking is a, a booming trendy thing right now. A lot yeah. of people are getting into it. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, you're, you're trying to promote historic camping as a way to relate to history and everything. Um, when or how common was hammock camping in the early 20th century? 
I, I, I've seen photographs, but most of them, uh, in my opinion, because you can't really prove anything unless you can interview the people who took the photographs. But uh, I think they were just there for motor camping and lounging. Uh, hammocks uh, started coming into the public consciousness uh, in World War II. Really? Yeah. As as, as the, the army was trying to find a way to get their, their troops in the Pacific uh, housed, you know, living, living in tents without having to build floors to keep their feet dry or uh, to, to let them sleep. Uh, uh, there are pictures of, uh, I believe, Guadalcanal and some of the other places where the tents are in a, a foot of water because, you know, when they put them up, it wasn't raining. And then it rained uh, and, and they, you know, that, so, so they came up with what is called the jungle hammock. Uh, I, I've owned one. Uh, if you're familiar with hammock ter- terminology at all, it's a bridge hammock. Uh, the design was perfected during the Vietnam War for, for pretty much the same purpose. But recreate uh, hammocks as a, uh, camping gear really didn't come into uh, play until the late 1980s. It's still a very relatively new uh, technology, if you will. Uh, and it's kind of a rabbit hole. But once you get into hammock camping, you, uh, you've got to do a lot of research and a lot of study and talk to a lot of people. It's easy to spend too much money in hammock camping. <laughs> Uh, because you, you, you uh, and, and the advice I would give anybody is don't go cheap. Uh, buy once, cry once. Uh, and do as much make your own gear as you can. Uh, the uh, science behind hammock camping I- involves, and, and this is one of the reasons uh, I, I got into sleeping bags, historic sleeping bags. Uh the science behind uh, hammock camping is uh, you laying in the hammock is pretty much the same thing as being on a, a overpass. Okay. The wind passing through the overpass makes the ice form on the bridge faster than it does on the ropes. Right. Okay. You're working with convection there. So your hammock works the same way. If you try to put a sleeping bag in your hammock, to insulate you, what happens is, is you crush the, the insulation in your sleeping bag up against the hammock, and that makes it worthless. The insulation is no longer any good, so you have to hang your insulation underneath. Okay, that's the science behind it. Uh, and, and that's why you see so many people in their 20s and 30s uh, sleeping in cots with mattresses or folded wool blankets or something like that is to uh and, and why i stress uh, a lot of people coming into the 1930 uh, into classic camping i stress you need a waterproof uh ground cover and some kind of under insulation to separate you from the planet okay what kind of historic tools can you use to do that effectively uh, a browse bag is what was probably the uh, uh, the most common uh, or just laying a tarp and and uh, making making a big pile of forest duff and browse, laying your uh, tarp over it and then sleeping on top of that. That's enough insulation, particularly if you're using a sleeping bag. That's enough insulation underneath you to separate you from the planet. Uh if you look at the uh, the last video, as we record this, it's the last video on the on the channel where I used uh, uh, a Civil War gum blanket and a wool blanket to make a browse bag. That that that's a common 1920s 1930s solution to under insulation uh, to have something to sleep on. Uh, it's particularly needed if you're going to use something like a wool blanket and not a sleeping bag because. Uh, once you lay on top of a wool blanket on on the ground, 
uh, you have practically no insulated insulation underneath you. It's better than nothing at all, but it's practically no insulation. Uh, right. But it, again, it, it was something uh, when I was younger, and, and a lot of people think that the reason that you put something underneath you while you're camping is as a mattress to make you more mm-hmm. comfortable, but it's not. It's to keep the planet from sucking the heat out of your body. Uh, and, and so your choices for what you're going to use have to conform to that need more than comfort. So, uh, you know, most of the time it could be taken care of by taking a wool blanket and folding it in into thirds and sleeping on top of that in another wool blanket. Or even as much as uh, just throwing a, a gum blanket on the ground with some leaves and things uh, underneath it. Uh, but that is that is the first mistake that most even modern day backpackers make is thinking you can sleep on the ground. If you, if you're in a sleeping right. bag, you know, but the thing about it is most insulation will get crushed. Uh, it doesn't matter what it, whether it's down or primal loft or hollow fill or, or even the older bags, K pock and cotton batting. It doesn't matter. You're going to crush it. You're going to reduce the loft to practically nothing, and uh, science takes care of the rest, which isn't good for you. So for those people who are are very used to a modern style of camping, it is kind of, uh, even if it's in your backyard, uh, mm-hmm. having the experience of taking real wool blankets, you know, 100% wool blankets, and trying yeah. to stay warm in a tent during even just like 35 40 degrees you know it it gets cold yeah yeah and and the thing about this it's it's not as difficult to do if you have proper insulation underneath you Uh, a wool blanket if you wrap yourself like a taco in a wool blanket and just lay on the ground that way uh you'll stay warm but not as warm as you would if you were laying on a pile of leaves right So uh, it's, again, it's kind of the, you can look at the history of camping a a little bit like a a wave pattern in that in the early 20th century, everybody had this knowledge, but, but a lot of times it wasn't based on their knowledge of science. It was just based on their knowledge of what everybody else was doing. Okay. And then you get to the, uh, the the wave goes down towards the end of the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, and that knowledge is uh, becomes lost. Okay, but the wave goes up as more people go camping and they discover the science behind it. Uh, the, the the principal problem with camping is staying warm is, is temperature control. Uh, you you can even stay warm if you're wet, if you've got the right stuff. Uh, wool will do that for you. Although the thing about wool stays warm when it's wet isn't really true. It just doesn't get as cold as the other fabrics do. Right. So uh, it's it, it's one thing I think that that modern backpackers and campers can learn more about what they need in the present day by studying or at least experiencing what was done a hundred years ago in in that some of those methods were more effective than what we can do today. It's just, we don't do it because it's too damn heavy. And, and so you can, you can learn, uh, if you learn the uh, the heavy way of doing it, the reason it, you you learn the reason why. Okay, uh, that, that that's what I love about living history as a learning tool. Uh, Me I, too. I love living history as a teaching tool, but I think it's more effective for us individually as a learning tool. Uh, you can learn you can learn why you need to bring uh, an inflatable pad with you uh, by learning what it's like 
uh, or what what those solutions were in the, in the 19th. Am I making you, do you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, you know, uh, and there's thousands of things. It, it, most of them is is tiny things. Uh, uh, I heard on your video the other day you were talking about titanium mugs. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, that wasn't a solution back in the 20s and 30s. Aluminum was the best solution. Uh, you learn that you should use titanium, or at, at the very least, you learn that titanium is available. Uh, and the reason why is preferable over aluminum. Uh, in other words, aluminum is not the best solution, and neither is plastic. Right. Okay. <laughs> Both, both of them are lightweight. Both of them will get the job done. Aluminum has its problems with uh, uh, chemicals and leaching and things like that. You get plastic too close to the fireplace, the, 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 the campfire, and you're drinking out of your hand for the rest of the trip. Uh, with titanium, right. you get the lightweight and you get something that is non-destructible, although the expense is uh you know you spend a lot more money on a titanium mug than you will on a on an aluminum mug you learn the reason why that's a good choice you know what i'm saying it's like i was saying oh, yeah. earlier buy once cry once uh uh we we've kind of had this discussion uh on uh on facebook and, and in private messages and i've mentioned to a lot of people there isn't that much scholarship in the history of camping, you know, uh, up until about 10 years ago, the most written about conflict in history was the Civil War. And I think I think uh, uh, two or three books a week were coming out ever, ever, ever since 1869. Right. Uh, it, it's only just recently that the Second World War has surpassed that. Uh but you can find all sorts of scholarship on on other things, and and I'll focus on collecting disciplines. You know, uh, you can you you can buy oh, a dozen books on collecting Hummel figurines, but I don't think anybody's written anything on collecting camping gear. No, no. And, and I I want to get some of that knowledge out, but I I I'm lazy. I don't I don't want to do it by writing a book. I'll <laughs> You know, I, uh, I'll I'll do it on the video, and and that's that's my goal is is to get as much of and and it's it's my opinion, but give my, as much about of my opinion about old time camping gear, uh, so that people can recognize what it is and collect it and learn from it, and maybe eventually. Somebody will will do a doctoral cert, uh, dissertation on collecting camping gear, and maybe we can start getting some information we can reference more than what just some crazy old man talks about every you know once a week. Uh, so, so you bring up we, something that uh, <laughs> takes me back to my origin story a little bit and meeting you, because uh, I so my kids uh, they were pretty young, and I'm a Civil War reenactor. And uh, one thing that is kind of frustrating is my kids would go to these Civil War reenactments because they're so young. There wasn't a whole lot for them to do, especially if there's an event that didn't have kids. Yeah. So I, I scratched my head and I found uh, your Facebook group, Bannerman, and several others. And I was like, man, this is cool. I can I could dress up my kids like a like scouts from the 1920s and 1930s. Now, luckily, yeah. scouting was such a huge program that uh, you can go on you know, eBay or other secondhand places, you can find you equipment that's cheap. And this is something you and I think getting into this field is rather excel in comparison to other living history fields. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the reason why I got into collecting camping gear is originally I was a military collector, uh, taking after my grandfather. Uh, at one point, I had the largest collection of World War I uniforms in the American Southwest. 
Oh, no. Somewhere about, I think I had a hundred. I I think I had like 184 World War I uniforms, all of them with different patches on them Uh, and and, and a bunch of other stuff. But the thing about it is, is that in collecting uh, militaria, I noticed we were coming across, I was coming across, and people were coming to me asking me advice about things that weren't military. Uh, it was camping gear. Right. Uh, somebody somebody would say, oh, is this a World War II sleeping bag? And I would say, no, it's, it's, it's not an Army sleeping bag. Even though it's khaki, it's not, the Army didn't have sleeping bags. And they become crestfallen. And suddenly it's not worth anything to them. And they just want to get rid of it. And I'll give them 10 bucks. And they're happy and I'm happy because they have been here, you know. Uh, and, and that's basically how my camping gear collection started was stuff that was misidentified as as uh, military gear. Uh, it's since gotten to be a, you know, a bit of an obsession. And occasionally I do spend more money. Than <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but it's all it's all it's all good stuff, Sean. It's all good stuff. <laughs> I need. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I've gotten to where I'm not so obsessive and, and, and I don't buy as much largely because uh, uh, my goal as far as collecting camping gear is just to have examples of types and try to get the first of uh that's why I was so excited to find that that K-Pox sleeping bag from 1914. I had no idea. That's about 15 years earlier than what I thought uh, uh, K-Pox was being used. Uh, Real, hold on just so, a moment. Yeah. So, so yeah. about that, that K-Pox sleeping bag, because you showed something in your video that I get giddy about, and I, I noticed that you get giddy about, is when you saw that logo... <laughs> and you were trying to do some backwards research on it, that's what led you to mm-hmm. know what the installation was. And you got like that eureka moment. Yeah, well, I, I, I knew what K-Pok was. I knew what K-Pok sleeping bags were. I, I knew who made them and, and, and that they were considered top of the uh, consumer level sleeping bag at the time. Uh, the thing I was excited about was finding one that was made so early be, before. Right. You, you know, uh, I, I had already learned about K-pop, uh, which, which is why I was trying to figure out what in the cornbread Hades this crap is. Uh, because, you know, collecting sleeping bags, the good sleeping bags, are the ones that don't have holes in them and don't have the insulation popping out. Right. So, uh, I'm shooting a video right now that it's got a nice label on the side that says K-Pox. So I know it's a K-Pox sleeping bag, but, uh, you know, I, I couldn't figure out what it was. The thing about the uh, uh, inter- fleece interlining. Right. Uh, that was the thing I was going after is the the word fleece. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I've always tried to make reproduction sleeping bags. And uh, as far as insulation is concerned... I thought, well, I could use polar fleece as, as an insulation uh, because, uh, you know, you're not going to see it. Right. But it, it would you know, it would perform the way it should. And, and all of a sudden, I'm, 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 I'm ecstatic to find a sleeping bag that uses fleece from 1914. So I know it's a it's an actual that was the first thing I became excited about. Uh and then I, I you know, uh, in tracking down the company is when I discovered they were using K-Pok uh, and, and that it was so early. Uh, I think the reason why uh, it didn't become more commercial until later on is, you know, uh, this company and, and you people are going to have to go watch my video <laughs> to find out Amen. what yes, you do. are talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, the company didn't sell sleeping bags very long at all. They just sold them during the war to British officers. And then they went back to making mattresses. So it was kind of a one-off thing. Uh, as far as collectability goes, it's 
you know, it's not like having a 1914 Coleman stove because everybody collects Coleman. Uh, I probably the only guy who has one British sleeping bag, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, finding that out, what was the exciting thing? And, and uh, it, it helps me with uh, trying to explain uh, the development of sleeping bags in the early 20th century. Like I said before, tents and stoves and 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 everything else associated with camping had pretty much established its form and function by the 1920s. Uh, sleeping bags were a totally different thing. We didn't get down to what we understand a sleeping bag is until the middle 30s, the, the, the early 30s. Okay, we, we had been recreationally camping for about 40 years before we finally got to a place where everybody pretty much agreed on what a sleeping bag should look like. <laughs> Rectangular and open up at the side. Okay, to, to, to simplify things. Uh, what that British sleeping bag does is it, it helps me establish the uh, the insulative qualities of KPOC and that somebody recognized it, they just weren't selling the sleeping bags they were selling didn't do very well, uh, uh, didn't market very well, uh, probably because it was Great Britain and they didn't do the same kind of camping we do here in the United States. Uh, and, and that's what's coming up on the channel next is, is uh, sleeping bags up until 1939, uh, from 1914 until 1939. Uh, so I'm I'm having fun with that, uh, but what I can't wait for when I'm, when I'm uh, I, the, the temptation I have is to break my discipline of following this chronologically and jump right into Kelty Pax. <laughs> you know, well, that's your know, era. That's that's your that's what you oh, experienced it growing up, right? And, that's, and the thing and the thing about it is, is when I was young. Uh, we was what's called po folks. Uh, Dad was a salesman at Sears Roebuck. Uh, so, uh, uh, number one, any camping gear we had was J.C. Higgins, and that was because he got a 10% discount. Everything else was uh, nice. Army surplus. And uh, I was not able to afford a Kelty pack uh, until I was in the Army. Uh, which was well after the uh, the era I'm excited about, you know, back when I was a kid and I wanted one real bad. Well, now I've got one. In fact, I got a few others. <laughs> uh, uh, and my uh, the prize piece in my collection, I, I have a, a Kelty pack made uh, in Dick Kelty's home before they opened their store in uh, in Glendale, California. The bag was sewn by uh, Nina, his wife, and the uh, the frame was welded in his garage. Uh, I've had conversations with his son, Richard. Uh, it's probably one of the first 1,500 Kelty packs ever made. Uh, it used Whoa. to be on my old page, my old Sarge Finding Facebook page, which is now uh, seen as demise. I had a very un uh, a very bad Facebook experience. I lost my previous account. And uh, five years of research dis uh, disappeared as a result. Uh, but I, I don't know if you've seen in, in the Kelty's Camp Facebook page. I don't know if you, you've gone there. Uh, there is a paper I wrote, uh, a PDF of a paper I wrote on Kelty Packs from, from his the beginning in 1952 until 1972 when Dick sold the company. Uh, that shows all of the different types of uh, packs and the development of the pack. And yeah, that 19, uh, probably 1955, 54, 55, when this pack was made, uh, it, it's kind of neat. I, I, I love going camping with it. Uh, I'm one of those old codgers, you know, oh, nobody, nobody likes these old, uh, aluminum frame packs, but they're better than anything else. Uh, I do prefer an aluminum frame pack, uh, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, if I, uh, 
the actual pack that I normally use if I'm going doing a modern day camping is a custom pack made by uh, uh, Chris Zimmer, Zimmer built pack. Uh, it's a pack I designed for hammock camping. Uh, there's a video of it in my hammock camping uh, playlist back there if you want to watch it. Oh, uh, I definitely <laughs> check that one out. Yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, uh, it was that pack is what inspired me to make my own gear. Uh, no, because I learned I could have made it myself. <laughs> as it was, as it was, it cost me, I think, close to three hundred dollars. Uh, and then I, this was ooh, 15, 20 years ago, I think, uh, when I when I had that pack made, which, you know, it probably costs a lot more than three hundred today. It's a fantastic pack. I love it. And Chris Zimmer is a good uh, he, he makes good product. And and uh, uh a mouse chewed a hole in my pack, uh, uh, and I, 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 I emailed him and said, Chris, how can I fix this? And he sent me patches uh, to, to, and, and told me how to, how to glue it in and everything like that. You know, it didn't charge me anything. He said, you know, you know hey, you got a mouse hole in, my, in one of the packs I made? Here, fix it. So, you know, that was good. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a good good pack. Yeah, like I said, you should watch that. E- eventually, that pack is going to be uh, uh, featured in the history of gear uh, when I illustrate uh, internal frame packs. You did a good thing, uh, by the way, when you, when you did your video on the uh, the Boy Scout pack, uh, the one with the uh, wooden frame, wooden internal frame. What what is it? The uh, oh, the Campo sack. The Campo sack, right. yeah, designed by uh, William I, Hillcourt, Green Bar Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I, I broke a YouTube rule and I made a video recommending your video. Uh, <laughs> well, because, bless you. Yeah, yeah. You're not supposed to do that because it, you know it, it promotes the other guy's channel. Uh, but no, uh, I, you let me know that the first internal frame pack was made in the 1920s. And if you go and you research uh, internal frame packs at all, you'll see that the consensus is is that the internal frame pack was invented by Jeff Lowe in about 1979, when really it was invented by, uh, who, who was it you said? William Hillcourt, Green Bar Bill. Uh, then Green Bar Bill uh, invented it 50 years before. So, uh yeah, no, you 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 informed me of something I did not know, and that's always a good thing to find out something you don't know. So, uh, but yeah, that that my my hammock pack is going to be featured as as part of that. Uh, and like I said, it's one of the reasons why I started getting deep into making my own gear. Uh, I think everybody should make their own gear. Everybody should buy a sewing machine and make something. Uh, uh, you should make a lot of things so that you can amortize the cost of your sewing machine. But that's, you know, that's kind of like going deer hunting, you know, where you say, yeah, look at all this meat I got. But it costs you seven thousand dollars in, <laughs> in guns and equipment to get 60 pounds of deer meat. So, so uh, but, yeah. what is your favorite style of camping with all these different experiences that you have, even in the Army? You know, what is your favorite style? Um, but it, again, if these days. It's actually getting back to crawling on my hands and knees to go to sleep, uh, to, to going and doing the, the, the classic camping, the vintage camping, uh, historic camping, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, the, my favorite gear list for going camping, uh, backpacking, is that uh, 1953, 54, 55, I, I forget exactly, but that, that Kelty pack. A uh, Frostline Kodiak tent. Oh, uh, Frostline was a company that sold uh, kits to make your own own gear. Uh, this is a, a, a kit that was finished sometime in about 1972 by someone whose name is long lost to history. But it is pretty much one of the coolest tents I have ever seen. And it's just a joy to, 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 to be in. I'll see if I can't send you a picture if you want to edit it into this. Uh, that 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 pack and and that tent. 
that's, that's one of those tents that proves the adage that a two man tent is really a one man tent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and that's the rule. Two is one, one is none. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, historic camping is my favorite way to go camping. Uh, I always learn something new, uh, it, it, even if it's just a little inconsequential thing. Uh, you know, it's like I said, I congratulate you for teaching me something new with the with the uh, internal frame pack. Uh, just learning something new, uh, learning that I'm leaning on some modern thing. When uh, if I want to understand and learn more, I should be doing this other thing. Uh, my latest addition to that setup, uh, you'll laugh at this, is a, a a rubber and canvas air mattress with a metal pump. Uh, that I, that I, yeah, uh, I'll try. I'll give you some pictures of that too if I can find them. But yeah, I, I carry the air mattress, and it's it's one of them hand pumps. Uh, Oh, it's about two inches in diameter. It's got a handle on it, and you, know, you use it to pump up the air mattress. Uh, but at that time, uh, it, this was before the uh, self-inflating mattresses and thing, and that was about the only thing anybody had as far as uh, sleeping pads at the time in, in the 60s and 70s was an air mattress. Uh, when I was younger, like I said, we were poor folks. If I wanted an air mattress, I had to go down to the... Uh, department store and get one of them vinyl air mattresses that never made it through the night you know you'd you'd, <laughs> you'd, you'd go cross-eyed blowing the damn thing up in the evening and then when you woke up you're laying on a flat piece of vinyl so uh, uh but you had to have something uh it, it, it's amazing that both that canvas and rubber air mattress from the 70s that i use and that one i found uh from a hundred years ago. Yeah, now that's a piece. That's cool. Um, yeah, they are they are more viable or as viable today. They're more viable than the vinyl ones that I used as a kid. Uh, that basically all they're really good for these days is is jumping on while you're in the pool. You know, uh, <laughs> and and and. and, and, and Think about that. That was camping gear 50 years ago. Your, your pool floaty was camping gear 50 years ago. That just one of the many things that, well, that has changed in my life. Right? No, uh, that that's my 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 favorite thing is, is my favorite style of camping is to, is to go historic camping, whether it's historic trekking or historic car camping, like like we did with Bannermans in the wild, or what we're going to do here uh, in May at uh, Kingsbury at the Pioneer Flight Museum. Uh, you know, that, that you know, go, going back to Dave Westcott and, and Steve Watts, the uh, the comfortable 1930s motor camping thing. Uh, I, I, I enjoy that as well, mainly because I'm hanging out with a bunch of my buds. That's the best part is hanging out with your buds around a campfire. That's, that's yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's the idea behind Bannerman's camp. You mentioned... Uh, uh, living history uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, the heart and soul of living history is not the venue, not time period. It's not even the event. It's the time you spend around the campfire with your buds after the event is over. You know, after after five o'clock on Saturday, after you know, or, or setting setting up Friday night. Uh, that's the heart. And, and I realized that, number one, me and a bunch of my friends are getting a bit too long in the tooth to portray <laughs> uh, the Civil War sergeant or the World War II corporal. Uh, but that, you know, I could get away with it when I was 45, but at 71, I'm pretty much lying to people that guys who look like me won the Second World War. Uh, so... And, and, and as well, you, you talk about ha having something that your kid can do. Well, now I've got something that an old man can do. And the old man can do it uh, historically accurate. Uh, 
where in let's just say the the second world war it would be historically inaccurate to have your wife and your kids there okay uh you could try to stretch it and say okay we're french uh, partisans or we're, we're we're french refugees or something like that but it really again you're stretching things but if you're camping that's exactly what a campsite would look like you know bunch of civilians of all ages and sexes getting together and having a good time, which again is the heart and soul of living history and reenacting. So right. I just, all I decided to do was, okay, I'm going to do something where I'm going to strip away the venue. I'm going to strip away the event. I'm going to keep a time period, but I'll make it about 50 years, you know, 1890 to 1939. Okay. And make it so that we're, we're, we're attractive to not only experienced living historians, but also experienced backpackers and bushcrafters. And mm-hmm. if we get them together, even electronically on, on YouTube and on Facebook, uh, we get to share information that each of us needs in order to perform the little living history task that we've got in front of us. Uh, Too many people in living history don't know enough about camping to be able to do it safely. A lot of truth in that. Okay. Uh, They can do it authentically, but can they do it uh, safely? Uh, Backpackers and bushcrafters uh, don't know much about living history. So these are things we can teach, and, and backpackers don't know a lot of the skills that bushcrafters do. When we put all three groups together, uh, we can come up with, a, like I said, a good teaching and learning tool. Uh, the video that's going to come out, it'll probably be out at, uh, before you release this, but uh, the video that I've got coming out next uh, uses uh, some pocket trash I bought from Nathaniel Logsdon's site, uh, some uh, money. He's got reproduction change there. And I use that to uh, illustrate, number one, the kinds of things, uh, what you can learn about what's in somebody's pocket, but also the fact that in 1930, I'm carrying around a $5 gold piece, which would be illegal two years later. Yeah. People don't think you know, about that. They don't, don't know it. That's for sure. Yeah. They don't realize that in 1930, I really don't have any need for a bill fault. All the money I use, my weekly wages is about six and a half dollars. It fits in a little tiny coin purse. Okay. Now, this is something that you can use to learn and teach the history of the period above and beyond the camping aspect. In other words, what we're doing is we're using the camping, which is attractive to people, uh, to teach the other things that were going on, the depression, uh, the change in the currency, the change in banking, uh, the rise of radio. You know, all of these things can be taught using camping in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm going to keep doing it. I, I don't see any reason not to. God, God's got God's got a lot of input on that, how long I, I do it. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm 70 years old now. Uh, God willing, I can do this for another 25 to 30 years, but we'll see. Uh, but I'll keep doing it until uh, uh, my... Uh, if I would express a, a preference... Uh, they would find my bones in the woods uh, three years after I've died on a camping trip. <laughs> <laughs> Be like one of those poor souls up in the, the Alps or uh, the Himalayas or something. Yeah. yeah With all your yeah, gear yeah. on and everything. <laughs> yeah. I find my bones as a result of global warming. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, and again, I, I hope to see, I know people are out there. 
uh, who are interested in this. Uh, you and I uh, are finding them in ones and twos and threes and fours, but uh, uh, eventually uh, you know, they'll number in the hundreds and the thousands. Uh, you know, Civil War reenacting started out with a bunch of guys with blue jeans and 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 uh, Dickie's <laughs> jacket. You know. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, guys just, you know, like, like I said in the, in the video, Farb, Farb comes from a civil uh, revolutionary war reenacting, not having enough guys be British, you know. Oh, wow, Alan. Yeah, yeah, they look fine. And now both of them are, are huge money makers that, that they're, you know, uh, civil war is a big industry. Civil war reenacting, civil war living history is a big industry. Uh, you've got plenty of choices. Uh, for for buying and selling, uh, it took a while for Civil War to get as big as it is. Uh, when I first started in World War II reenacting, uh, it was, and again here I go being an old man. Uh, it was a new thing. There really weren't a lot of people engaging in World War II reenacting uh, back in the 1990s, but today. Right. You've got huge events up, up, up in your neck of the wood. What is it, Conneaut or? Uh, oh yeah, Conneaut's big. Did I say it right? Because I've never heard anybody yeah. say it. I've just read it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, you've got you've got big events now. Where uh, when when we first started, if we could get forty guys together, twenty Germans and twenty Allied, not even Americans, you know. And, Five Americans, five Brits, a couple of guys doing French, you know, that kind of thing. We were happy. That was a big event. Uh, today, you, you can get events not in the in the hundreds. Uh, I believe classic camping is heading that direction. One of the reasons, like I said, is a lot of those guys who started out when I did are aging out and are looking for something. They, they, they still want to do the living history. They still want to do reenacting, but they're trying to find something where uh, uh, their age appropriate, uh, which is what I'm mm -hmm. trying to do. I'm trying to popularize that among older reenactors, but I'm attracting, uh, we're attracting a, lo a lot of younger guys. Uh, uh, and I can tell you that I am gratified in that the uh, younger folks that I am seeing coming into the classic camping uh, living history are very dedicated uh living historians they, they are actually interested in the discipline uh, many of them are getting education or have employment in living history uh, so i'm i'm seeing that and i'm i'm gratified by that because i see that as bringing in uh, more folks to do what we're doing uh, but the main thing is, Sean, you know, uh, you and I, if, if, if we want to see it grow, we just need to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, I don't I don't lose heart because I don't have 78,000 subscribers like uh, Blackie Thomas does. Uh, good for Blackie. I want 78,000 subscribers. <laughs> I think it would be great, but I'm not going to quit because I don't have it. Smart. So I was, I was, able, yeah, I was, I was able to get, well, it's just like, it, it was the thing everybody was doing because uh, there wasn't a whole lot written down. There weren't a whole lot of commercial vendors. Uh, most everything at that time was being done by cottage vendor. Uh, by about ooh, 2005, uh, the market got big enough so that some guys could quit their day job and go to making full-time making hammock equipment uh there's a couple of guys now who've got pretty big businesses um both of them uh by the way uh sell a lot of make your own gear stuff uh so i i had i have that advantage uh as far as youtube is concerned and that i had a subscriber base uh out of the 1500 or so that I had subscribed to me when I stopped making videos. Uh, I'm pretty sure none of them are watching the new videos, but YouTube sees that number 
YouTube sees that I've got X number of subscribers and it's over the limit. Uh, they don't recognize that, you know, maybe 60% of them aren't watching my videos anymore. They're just there. Uh, so, I, you know, like I said, I have that advantage. And I still am getting some traffic with the hammock camping videos. There are still people searching for hammock camping videos, particularly mm -hmm. to make your own gear stuff. Uh, so I am seeing a lot of traffic on that. I've got a couple of videos. Uh, I think I got one that's got 23,000 views. Oh. Uh, my goal, one of my goals there was to show people that uh, camping doesn't have to be expensive. And, and I was buying a lot of uh, inexpensive uh, stuff and testing it and, and, and reviewing it. Uh, stuff from like Banggood and... Uh, uh, I, I realized, uh, you know, that I was never going to see any return on that investment, even even though it was a, a, a fifteen dollar, you know, mess kit or something like that. Uh, at the rate that I was, I had my YouTube money coming in. I wasn't going to amortize that if I kept doing it. Right. You know, now, as far as the hammock camping gear is concerned, I was using that. You know, if, if I did a make your own gear video because I made a piece of gear I was using uh, with this, uh, with what I'm doing now, uh, I'm getting to the point now where I, I do want to make more stuff, but I don't need the stuff I'm going to make. So some of it I'm going <laughs> to give away. Well, yeah, uh, the, the the sleep, the, the one I did on Warren Miller's sleeping bag, I, I gave that to uh, my buddy Grant, Grant Hansen. Uh, you, you, you've seen him on the, he's the guy that falls asleep at every event. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are pictures. We have pictures. Uh, so I gave that to him, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at stuff that I'm going to make uh, that I will probably offer for sale. Uh, one of the things you do, if you get deep into uh, make your own gear, you suddenly find yourself with a closet full of fabric. <laughs> uh, uh, which is what I have. I have a closet full of fabric, so I'm I'm actually not going to be, you know. Uh, although I did just conclude a deal with Jerry Lee. Um, Ooh, what? He Can you speak uh, about it. He's yeah. I'll, I'll I'll let you know about it. Uh, yeah, it, it might even arrive in the mail here uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, you saw the video I did on his. Uh, comforter his civilian conservation corps comforter and how you can make sleeping yeah. bags out of it. i was able to buy from him the end of production run fabric i got about 20 yards of the fabric that that is made out of uh and i will use that to um, make a couple of sleeping bags and as parts and pieces of sleeping bags that i'll be making from that uh, CCC comforter. And I am probably going to buy, uh, make a bulk buy from him on uh, those comforters. Uh, for people, I know I do these make your own gear videos. I know people watch them. Uh, and I know most of the people who watch them aren't actually going to take the time to make something. For some reason, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're interested and that's fine. I also know that people, there are people who would like to have one of these things, but they don't have the time or they don't think they have the skill. Uh, so I'm going to make a couple, I'm not going to make a lot, uh, because the market is incredibly small. Right. Uh, but I'm going to make several sweeping bags uh, that do replicate some of the ones I'm talking about, uh, in the next upcoming videos. Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, it's something I've been wanting to do. I've been trying to do for about the past eight years. Uh, the the first uh, reproduction sleeping bag I made, I attempted to make a Kenwood sleeping bag uh, using the information and the illustrations I had on the Internet. I remember that. Uh, yeah. And I actually made one. But I didn't take any pictures and I didn't talk about it because I, you know, I, I wasn't really sure if I was right. 
And yeah, I hear about two, three years later, I managed to, 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 to find a real, two real Kenwood bags to make the whole system. And yeah, I was completely wrong. If, uh, if, if, if I had tried to sell that as a reproduction or pass it off as a reproduction, I would have been telling a great big lie. Uh, um, and, and it's one of the reasons why I bought a couple of sleeping bags that I don't really need, that don't really fit in the collection. Uh, but I can use them as patterns uh, and, and study construction methods for making them. Uh, one of the, the the video I'm shooting right now is on uh, is on the K-Pop bags, uh, Tapatco and Hirsch Wise sleeping bags of the 1930s. Uh, and I opened the video uh, with uh, illustration or uh, showing two cotton bags, cotton batting mm-hmm. bags, bearing cotton batting insulation to the K-POC insulation, why K-POC was superior. Uh, and one bag uh, is a, one I found in a World War I uh, U.S. officer's uh, bedroll that, that is the first reproduction I will likely make. Uh, it's a unique opening method in that it doesn't open along the side. It opens along both sides for about the first third of the body. So you can open the whole thing and crawl in rather than trying to flip it over on one side and then throw it back over on top of you. Watch the video. You'll see it. Uh, in fact, I think I show it in that video I did about the uh, uh, pre-production uh, quilt I got from Jerry. So that will be one of the first ones I make. And then I will make some with covers, uh, canvas covers uh, that replicate the later uh, K-Pok bags, uh, even though it's well, the later cotton batting bags, which is which is what that CTC right. uh, comforter is made of. Although he's, he's using polyester filling, uh, which doesn't bother me at all and would bother some purists but you know you don't see it so you don't see it and it feels exactly like cotton what's your problem right you know and it'll keep you warm so uh, uh go ahead. those are the uh the listeners who may not know what ccc is that's the civilian conservation corps during the great depression right yeah yeah the civilian con- uh, i'm i'm thinking about doing a video on the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, again, to use camping as a way of explaining the economics of the time. And the reason why uh, the government having to employ a huge number of young men and veterans uh, to work on uh, uh, trails and and, uh, camping areas in state and national parks. it was was because there was no no jobs for them, right? And they didn't want to just simply take a handout. They wanted to do something. So, uh, in, in one respect, they were doing make work projects, uh, stuff that would not normally have been done. Uh, in in one respect, we can say, well, we're probably lucky that they did it because we do have established campsites in state and national parks. We do have trails. We do have a lot of things. Uh, But a lot of the work they did wasn't really necessary. And today would probably not be allowed uh, because of uh, environmental concerns. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we can use the camping because the, the principal benefactor of the Civilian Conservation Corps are guys like you and me. Guys who go camping, guys who go hiking in the woods. We are the benefactors of the tremendous financial problem that happened uh, after 1932. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, again, that's how that's how camping. I, I, I guess you know, one of the reasons why one of the things I explain to people about living history and how it's a good teaching tool is you can connect people. Uh, the way I would explain it to young kids coming in uh, to the World War II stuff I was doing is you can stand there and you can talk to an eight-year-old girl as much as you want about World War II. 
and how the soldiers lived. And she'll politely listen, but probably not gain much. But yeah, I've been on that end. Fact, <laughs> if you consider the fact that this eight year old girl might be watching her daddy shave every day, or at least get a chance to see him shave on the weekend. And then you show them how you shaved in World War II. There's a connection that can be made. My daddy right. shaves. This guy is shaved. Maybe I listen to my daddy. Maybe I should listen to this guy. Okay. <laughs> and, I, you know, and, and that's what camping does for us. Uh, one of the more gratifying things I, I, I find in uh, classic camping living history is I get a lot more informed uh, and educated questions. Uh, since I've been doing public uh, classic camping interpretation, I don't think I have ever heard anyone ask, is that a real fire? Okay, <laughs> That's a classic for living history. <laughs> That's a classic for living history. Uh, it, it, <laughs> if you go to a Civil War reenactment, if you go to a World War II reenactment and you've got a fire, they'll ask you, is that real fire? Or did you sleep in that tent last night? Yeah. But if doing a public presentation of camping, most of them automatically understand that's what you did. You came here and you slept in that tent last night because you're camping, not because you're you know, if you're a soldier. They don't they don't make that connection that that soldiers do a lot of camping, you know. And again, that's where, that's where we go back. We say that's the heart and soul of living history and reenacting is actually the camping. Right. Uh, so uh, that, that that's one of the more rewarding things I found about classic camping living history. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation last year uh, after the second question uh, from a, a young girl in her 20s. It immediately became apparent to me that she had done some long distance backpacking. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, oh, let me sing the song of my people. Uh, you know, here's somebody who gets it who who understands uh who asks the right questions and i get to give that answer you know i, I don't have to go into a long explanation of of before i get to giving the answer uh so uh again you don't find that in other living history pursuits uh but in, in other words, you, you could set up at a Civil War event, and the only person who's going to ask you about uh, Civil War history questions that relate to your living history presentation is other reenactors. You, you know what I'm saying? They're the this ones who true. are informed enough to ask you the right questions. But if you're doing the classic camping living history, well, now you're getting uh, people who... Uh, uh, who are using a, a, a isobutane stove and become really interested in the operation of that Primus stove that you've got, you know? Uh, so that's, again, that's the rewarding thing about classic camping living history is encountering those people who have got the modern day knowledge and the modern day experience of exactly what it is you're doing. Uh, if, if I do living history in front of uh, soldiers, I've, I've done a lot of stuff at the uh, Air Force and Army bases, uh, the museums of, of, of those facilities. And those are great events because I'm getting informed questions from uh, soldiers uh, who participate, you know, who, who, who do the stuff I'm doing. They're just doing it modern ways. So this is rough, uh, classic camping hit living history is roughly akin to doing world war ii living history at fort hood okay uh you you, you you've got an informed audience uh, and that's what i love about going out into the woods just before covid i had started a, a, a living history group called uh, hike into history mm -hmm. where we, we, we used 1970s gear 
and we would get on the Lone Star Trail, which is which is my long distance trail. Uh, we would get in there and hike in oh, two miles, a mile and a half, something like that from the trailhead and set up. And then just talk to anybody who came by. Uh, you know, if you want an informed audience who's interested in what you're doing, boy, how to do that? You know, the only thing is your presentation better be pretty short because they're on their way somewhere. <laughs> right. You know, right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, uh, of course, then COVID hit and everything fell apart. Uh, it's what we did when we did Bannermans in the wild. Uh, I'll be doing a similar thing in June uh, for trail days down here. Well, you and I talked about trail days uh, a while ago, uh, but uh, the uh, Lone Star Trail Club is doing a trail days thing, and I'll be going there. I haven't quite decided yet whether I'm going to do 1930s or pull all that 1970s stuff out. I'm kind of leaning towards the 1970s because last year was the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Lone Star Trail. And by 1973, it probably would have been started being well used, uh, using the gear that I'll be bringing. And I think that's what I'm going to do. And, and I'll shoot some video of that. And I'll have that uh, that frost line tent and uh, the Kelty pack and a, uh, a number of other things. Although I will be bringing my Primus 71 stove. That is my favorite piece of gear. I, I, I love that Primus 71 stove, and it was in use from, you know, the 1930s until the 1980s. Uh, so, I, you know, I will probably bring that and, uh, you know, a, a bunch of other things, because I, I believe that that will be my audience at, at that particular presentation, will be people who are more interested in the 1970s stuff than they would be in the 1930s stuff. So... Well, the nice thing about that also is the generation of people that might be visiting it, they'll be able to make those connections. And they might even point out to younger people like, hey, this is what I use or this is what I remember seeing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I am not seeing as many people my age on the trail these days as I did 20 and 30 years ago. Right. Uh, like I said, I, you know, I... I I, I used to be able to go out and, and hike 10 miles before I made camp. Now I want to camp after about three, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I plan my camping that way these days. Uh, yeah. I don't want to do too much more. And I also, I, I want to go with young people so that there's somebody strong enough to drag my body out of the woods after I collapse. <laughs> uh, so uh, but, as we start, wrapping things up here uh don't want yeah. to take too much of your time and we could go on forever man like this, that's what i love oh, yeah. about yeah. campfire yeah. chats like they, just, they could just throw some all more night. wood on the campfire yeah just, just the smoke <laughs> um, is coming in my direction so uh a lot of people express the issue of time right you know having time to get out so what is your advice of for young people or older people or whatever try to get time to get outdoors with your experiences uh that is difficult because uh life reenact well when you have the money to do it is pretty much after uh the kids have left yeah you know and it's easier to find time the challenge is to find time while you're making a career and growing your family. And that is the most important time to find a time to do that. Uh, you just have to make the time uh, to go camping. Uh, don't. Don't destroy your career. Don't destroy your marriage. Right. Take the time to get out in the woods and get away from all this crap. You know, uh, there's the element of challenging yourself. Uh, you need to do that. And it needs to be something more than challenging yourself to get a raise. Uh, it needs to be something that the... Uh, 
the, the, the only reward you get is is, is spiritual, uh, whatever your spiritual pursuit is. Uh, but getting out in the woods, spending time, smelling sunlight on hot, uh, making pine needles hot. Uh, there's, there's joy in that. Uh, God put that joy out there for you. You've got to find it, though. Uh, so how you make the time? Geez, I, I can't tell you because I don't know your personal situation. Uh, what I can tell uh, tell you what I did was is, is uh, I, I kept my pack loaded. You know, the, the stuff was already in the pack. The sleeping bag was was there. Uh, the mess kit, everything was in the pack. And if I had the thought, yeah, I want to go out in the woods, I would go out in the woods. I would just grab the pack and go. Whether it was for a couple hours and I was just, uh, you know, going to hike a, a five-mile trail at the state park down the road, or if I was going to go out for a weekend, uh, I did it as soon as my spirit told me to you know what i'm saying you lose a bit of it if you over plan it uh right it becomes a chore at that point yeah yeah and and, and at the same time we talked earlier about the importance of planning and so so there's there's a bit of a dichotomy there but uh you you just you, you just need to be ready to go keep your pack loaded with everything but food. Don't keep food in there. It'll smell bad. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, have have your mess kit. You're clean. Have your, you know, all your gear clean, ready to go, and in the pack so that all you have to do is grab that pack and put it in the car. You know, uh, that that's the way to do it. it, it uh, vacation. That's the time for the family. That's the time to take the family camping. But for yourself, uh, again, as long as you're not destroying your marriage, as long as you're not destroying your career, be ready to go. Just be ready. To, don't don't make it a chore to pack your crap and go because you're going to lose four or five hours doing that. But if all you got to do is say, you know, in the morning, I'm going to go hike five miles. You know, everything is in the pack, ready to go. All you got to do is, my habit was to stop at Subway's. You know, I I would eat breakfast at home. If I was going to do that, I'd eat breakfast at home. I'd stop at Subway's on the way, put that sandwich in the pack and go, you know, have water in the, in, in the, uh, in, in the canteens. And and I would eat the Subway sandwich. Didn't make a big production. Now, if I was going to go weekend camping, it's a whole different story. Right. But, uh, you know, that food uh, for backcountry camping, you can put that in your pack as long as it's sealed and packed because you, you don't want to be bringing fresh and wet food with you anyway. So, I don't know, pack your pack uh, and have a second bag for a weekend trip or something like that. That's, that's uh, good. It's solid. Yeah, yeah. Have have two bags. Have, 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 you know, have a day pack and a backpack. Uh Day packs are something I didn't have when I was a kid. You know, uh, Jans, Jansport came out with the first day packs in about the 1970s, and they were sold as book bags. Uh, you, it was either the big backpack or, you know, fill a pillowcase full of stuff and throw it over your shoulder uh, for a short trip. So, yeah, just always keep your pack packed. Whether you're uh, going to do, you know, do more hikes than you do overnight camping. That's another thing. Uh, it's easier to make time for a hike than it is to make time to uh, spend two nights in the woods. You know what I mean? Mr. Vining, thank you so much for all the advice. I, I love the stories and the history and the connections. Like, it makes it so much more real. Where can the listeners and viewers uh, find you? What are your socials? Well, you know, of course, you know, there's there's the YouTube channel, uh, Sarge Vining. Uh, 
I've been playing with changing the name to Bannerman's Camp, but so many people know me as Sarge Vining. It's probably a bad <laughs> idea. And then there's the Bannerman's Camp Facebook page, uh, which kind of got this whole living history thing rolling uh, as far as our version of classic camping. And for the 1960s, the post-World War II, we have a, a Facebook page called Kelty's Camp, which is just now getting off its feet, uh, mainly because I am still concentrating on, as far as the history of gear is concerned, in the 1920s and 30s. I will eventually be getting into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, and we'll be focusing more over there. But it may take a, it may take a while. The, the History of Gear series on the YouTube channel is a long-term project. So, but that's how people can find me. Uh, uh, unless you want to hear my politics and, and, and things, you know, don't, don't get on my <laughs> personal page. Uh, I, I have opinions and I'll let you know what they are. Uh, if you don't want to know my opinion, don't they can get, get off your lawn, lawn, right? Huh? They can get off your lawn, right? Yeah, get off my lawn. Uh, <laughs> But but yeah, that's that that's basically where you can find me is Bannerman's Camp and Kelty's Camp and on the uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, this is the only thing, the only drawback to having Bannerman's Camp is uh, I'm not getting as many comments on the YouTube channel as I should, because most of the conversation is happening over there at Bannerman's Camp. That's <laughs> we can, you know, well, we can we can share photographs and and and. Uh, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that we've got uploaded in the files that I've uploaded and other members have uploaded uh, period magazines and catalogs and things like that. Uh, so if you all are interested in uh, classic camping or the history of camping gear at all, yeah, get on Bannerman's camp. And uh, on if you're in Bannerman's camp, I believe that uh, the other uh, Vintage camping sites on Facebook uh, allow members of Bannerman's Camp to become members of theirs without uh, without approval, like the Amalgamated Order of uh, Motor Campers and uh, uh, Camping in the Old Style. And I know I'm going to miss somebody, and I'm sorry, but uh, and and you can probably provide a list after you've done editing this of all the other. There's about four or five other. Uh, Classic camping, vintage camping, historic camping, uh, whatever you want to call it, associated sites. Uh, each one of us takes a little bit of a different approach to the subject. Uh, Bannerman's originally started to, uh, because of the use of army surplus uh, in the uh, in the 20th century, as far as camping is concerned. Uh, so and and the recognition that there's a lot of that stuff out there in the hands of reenactors who can use it to do the classic camping living history. So that's that's our focus. Uh, we are more living history oriented, where some of the others are more history oriented. Uh, we're also uh, somebody mentioned to me a while ago that Bannerman seems to have a lot of collectors in it. So yeah, if you're interested in collecting classic camping gear. Uh, you should probably look into uh, getting a membership with in, in, in Bannerman's camp. I'll let you in as long as you're not a commie or a child molester or a commie child molester. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's it. So I do, I do, uh, I do look forward to people uh, coming and joining us. Uh, I hope that this podcast brings more people to your channel and mine and some of the others that are cropping up. We've got a couple other guys that are, that, that are working on their own channels. Uh, and I'm glad to see that. The more the merrier, the more information that is out there, the more people are going to be attracted to the discipline. So thank you for this opportunity. And, and, and like I said, you and I, you and I have been exchanging uh, private messages and, and uh, more public chats in, in some of the social media Glad to have a conversation with you. Finally, it doesn't involve me pounding my fingers on a keyboard. <laughs> uh, and like that to Texas, uh, we'll get, we'll see about getting you a salsa card uh, that you know, so that you can come back in later. 
So well, I, I appreciate it, Sarge, providing uh, the, the opportunity to speak to you and uh, get some of your knowledge and wisdom. Definitely, I'll put all the links of all the different socials in the, the show notes on for the podcast and on the YouTube channel. I'll put it in the description box so everybody can go there. And if you have any interest in whatsoever in historic camping, even if you don't want to get in the living history side of it, like Sarge said, the academic side, you know, the, the nerding outside of just this equipment is uh is really heavy in all the different groups with their specific disciplines you can learn so much and it's i am they're all very welcoming groups i i am looking for a nerd with writing skills i really am (laughs) (laughs) well thank you sarge i appreciate you all uh watching or listening to the podcast make sure to hit subscribe check out sarge Vining's videos and everything i hope you guys have a wonderful evening a kiss hug to your loved ones and we'll catch you later thank you very much